Welcome to Philip Futures webinar. I'm Joyce, investment analyst with Philip Futures. Sugar plays an important part of human diet and can be an important part of our investment portfolio as well. In the next 20 minutes or so, I will bring you through an introduction to the sugar futures market. Disclaimer: This presentation is solely for educational purposes only. No part of this webinar should be taken as investment advice. This is the agenda for today. Before we begin investing in sugar, we should first seek to understand the sugar commodity. The major use of sugar, otherwise known as sucrose, is as a food sweetener. We see sugar in many forms, granulated sugar, icing sugar, brown sugar. Do not underestimate the amount of sugar we consume. It is estimated that an average human being consumes close to 25 kilograms of sugar annually. Although several natural and synthetic alternatives have been discovered, None of them is commercially viable enough to fully replace the sucrose sugar. Sugar is also used as a food preservative. It is commonly used to maintain freshness of baked goods, jellies, gems and citrus fruits. It is used in food processing, such as for fermentation of bread, breads. And because of its high energy level, it is also used as a feedstock. Lastly, like corn, it can also be fermented into useful alcohol, such as ethanol, which is used as a renewable fuel. Sugar was once a very precious commodity. Because of its high commercial value, its production and consumption have played pivotal roles in many turns in history. To name some, sugar was once called white gold and is a symbol for status. It drove the slave trade when Americans rapidly expanded sugar planting to reap high profits. In fact, it was so prominent that the history of every nation in the Caribbean and parts of South America was shaped by it. And the Americans have to credit this white commodity for its independence. So why was sugar such a precious commodity? It has got to do with its sources. Today, sugar is produced from two sources, sugar cane and sugar beet. 75% of global sugar comes from sugar cane, while the rest comes from sugar beet. This was not so, just one and a half centuries ago, sugar cane used to be the only source of commercially produced sugar. Sugar cane originated in the Southeast Asian region of New Guinea some 8,000 years ago. However, it was the Indians who discovered the process of extracting the sugar juice from sugar cane and then crystallizing it into fine white crystals. This process is called sugar crushing. But it did not reach the Europe until the Crusaders to the East returned to Europe in the 11th century and brought sugar back. But because sugar cane is suited only for tropical weather, it cannot be produced in temperate Europe and was prohibitively expensive, hence called white gold. In the mid-1700s, a German scientist discovered that beet also contains sucrose, the same type of substance found in sugar cane that sugar is extracted from. But it was not until 50 years later that the first sugar beet processing factory emerged in Europe. Finally, sugar can be produced economically in Europe by processing of sugar beet, which is suited for temperate climate. Today, the main sugar cane producers are Brazil, India, China, Thailand. The top sugar beet producers are the EU27 countries, Russia, US, Ukraine and Turkey. Since 75% of global sugar output comes from sugar cane, let's find out more about the sugar cane plant. The sugar cane plant belongs to the grass family. It has 37 different species, of which the Saturum officinarum is the most commercially produced sugar cane because of its high sucrose level. Globally, about 24 million hectares of sugar cane is cultivated annually, translating to about 75% of global sugar output. Apart from sugar, sugar cane is also produced to ethanol. Sugar ethanol accounts for about 8% of global ethanol output. The top five producing countries together account for more than 72% of total world harvests. Sugar cane has three main planting seasons, but in fact, they can be cultivated all year round given ample sunlight and moisture. The season of active growth varies from place to place ranging from 6 to 8 months in the US to 2 years in Hawaii. But most common period of active growth is between 12 to 16 months. Like any other agriculture plant, the sugarcane plant is susceptible to adverse weather conditions during its planting and growing periods. 
Optimally, there should be sufficient intense sunlight, high level of moisture in the air and soil throughout its growth, but little to moderate rainfall close to its maturity. In largest producing country Brazil, this means that little rain in the months of April to May is conducive. The most important yield determining growth stage of the sugarcane plant is its grand growth phase. During this period, the sugarcane plant elongates upward rapidly and excess water may dilute the accumulation of sucrose content in the cane. Moving on to a jump start into the futures market. Sugar contracts come in two types, raw sugar and white sugar. The picture on the right compares raw sugar and white sugar. Although there are many existing sugar futures on various exchanges in different countries, we will focus on the global benchmark contract for each type of sugar contract. The benchmark of raw sugar futures is set by Sugar 11 contract on the New York Board of Trade, while the benchmark of white sugar futures is set by the Sugar Number no. 5 contract on the London International Financial Futures Exchange, the LIFE. White sugar is simply another term for refined sugar. Since it is the refined product of raw sugar, white sugar futures are always priced at a premium to raw sugar. This premium is commonly referred to as the refining margins. To calculate refining margins, divide the raw sugar price by 1007 and the white sugar price by 2204.62. Marketing year for sugar is from October each year to September the following year as worldwide harvesting of the crop typically starts in October every year. A comparison of the contract specifications of the two benchmark contracts. Note that, other than on the Nightbot, the raw sugar number no. 11 contract is also cleared on various other trading platforms, such as the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. However, those listed on other exchanges are cash settled instead of physically settled. The raw sugar futures market is well traded compared to other soft commodities markets. This is an important feature because a liquid market ensures better price discovery and allows investors like you and I to enter and exit the market easily. Here is the 5-year US raw sugar front month contract prices. On a very broad basis, it's still on an upward trend. But on a nearer term, if sugar breaks lower and makes lower lows, we could see a bearish downward trend forming. The London White Sugar Front Month contract prices show a very similar trend. So what are the factors driving the long-term upward trend and short-term large fluctuations that we see here? Like any other agricultural commodity futures, sugar prices are driven by a variety of factors simultaneously. In the long term, prices are influenced by big picture expected supply, demand and exports. Supply factors include production output, which is affected by cost of producing sugar, acreage of the sugar farmers decide to plant, and of course, the attractiveness of alternative production processes such as sugar ethanol fermentation and its demand. Today, about 90% of the new cars sold in Brazil can run on a combination of ethanol and gasoline as motor fuel. Although sugar is by far the preferred commodity of production compared to ethanol because of the higher prices that sugar can fetch, the use of ethanol biofuel is heavily regulated and any drastic policy changes may shock this delicate balance of sugar ethanol output, ultimately moving prices. The expected ending stocks often affects the overall supply picture as well. In general, when supply is low, long-term prices tend to trend higher, and when supply is high, long-term prices tend to trend lower. Export is a measure of demand in the global market. It is affected most noticeably by the direction of long-term foreign currency trends and trade policies among sugar exporting and sugar importing countries. Sugar is one of the most heavily regulated and protected industries in many countries, ranging from domestic price laws and production quotas to export restrictions and import quotas. We will examine this in greater detail later. Demand. Demand here refers to domestic human consumption in all the countries in the world. The basic use of sugar as a sweetener and food addictive correlates its demand to population growth. As sugar is a common ingredient in high-end non-stable food products such as desserts and confectionery, its demand is also closely tied to the growth of effluents. The attractiveness of substitutes such as synthetic sweeteners also affect the demand for sugar. 
Lastly, since sugarcane can be readily processed into ethanol, a renewable biofuel, the prices of ethanol will also affect producer preference to produce sugar or ethanol. Just like long-term prices are affected by long-term factors, short-term prices are affected by short-term variations in the marketplace. The most immediate factor are market sentiments. Market sentiments depend on market developments on a broader level, the effects of which flows through altering the risk appetite of investors. For example, immediately after stimulus measures announced by the US Federal Reserve, investors saw hope in the economy and added risk to their profile with net longs in commodities futures. Commodities futures are considered a more risky asset class than equities because of its volatility. Hence, macroeconomic developments that whet the risk appetite of investors will stimulate commodities prices. Collective buying and selling of futures by commodities funds and hedge funds usually effectively expresses market sentiments and drive markets. On a broader basis, market sentiments are driven by news, reports, and the official figures relating to the fundamentals of the crop. This include figures on crop condition, crop yield, and crop production. Favorable or adverse weather conditions for the crop, especially during its yield determining phase and harvesting phase. They usually cause investors to speculate a rise or drop in expected crop supply and pressure or support prices respectively. Apart from crop growth, there may also be temporary supply disruptions due to storage and transportation bottlenecks or temporary export restrictions due to low stocks. Both supply disruptions and trade restrictions drive prices upwards. Apart from fundamentals, there are also technical buy and sell signals that cause investors to collectively react in similar manners. Common examples are a correction or retracement of an upward or downward trend, overbought or oversold signals, and prices rising through key resistance levels leading to more upward motion, or conversely, prices falling through, through key support levels leading to prices tumbling further. Lastly, fluctuations in the foreign exchange market also influence investors' willingness to long certain futures contract. For both raw and white sugar, their contracts are priced in the US dollar. If USD appreciates against other currencies, sugar futures contracts will become less affordable to investors holding currencies other than the USD, hence dampening demand for sugar futures. The reverse is true. When the USD depreciates against other currencies, it is likely that investors will be more willing to buy sugar futures that are priced in the USD. So how are the long-term and short-term factors of the sugar market like now? Global demand has been on a rising trend. Human domestic consumption, the largest and fastest growing demand sector, has been growing steadily at a rate of 1.8% per year. The major growth engine comes from population expansion and growing affluence in developing nations. Going forward, demand growth is likely to continue, but the current growth rate may not be sustainable because population and economic growth in China and India, world's largest nations, is tapering off. The five major consumers in the world, comprising of India, the EU27 countries, China, Brazil and the US, consumes about half of global human domestic consumption. As mentioned just now, the growth engine for sugar comes from developing nations such as China and India. Just five years ago, domestic demand for human de domestic consumption in China and India as a proportion of global demand for human domestic consumption was three percentage points lower than it is now. Demand changes in these countries should be closely watched for price signals. On the production front, production in all major producing countries except India has been rather stable and on an increasing trend in the past years. Brazil leads global production with 21.67 of total world production, followed by India, the EU27 countries, China and Thailand. Weather was the culprit to the sudden dip in the sugar production graph above. In marketing year 2008-9, it was a disastrous year for India. The nation suffered severe water shortages for its agricultural crops as a result of a dearth of monsoon rains. Consequently, India's cane sugar production almost halved from marketing year 2007 and 8 to marketing year 2008 and 9, and the world experienced an unprecedented sugar supply shock that year, which sent sugar prices skyrocketing. 
We will now closely examine some policies and issues pertaining to sugar, which has introduced volatility in sugar market. Future changes in these policies will also likely change the sugar futures market structurally and fundamentally shift sugar prices higher or lower. Firstly, we have Brazil. Brazil is a major player in the world sugar market. Not only is it the major producer of sugar, its share of global exports climbed from under 25% in marketing year 2001 to over 43% in the current marketing year, with exports of just over 25 million metric tons. Policy changes and economic conditions that affect Brazil's ability to produce sugar will reverberate throughout the global market. The factors affecting Brazil's sugar production and exports can be summarized into three main points. Its varying cost of production, which in part is a result of the real and USD exchange rate, and its growing domestic demand for ethanol. Brazil is a low-cost producer of sugar, particularly in the center-south region of the country. Brazil's cost of production hovers around 75% of world average cost of production. The graph here shows that both raw and refined sugar prices are closely related to Brazilian production costs. A key factor affecting these costs is the exchange rate between the US dollar and the Brazilian currency, the real, because sugar is traded in USD in international markets. When the USD is strong against the Brazilian real, Brazilian sugarcane producers' costs are relatively lower, which makes exports more competitive. For instance, if Brazilian production costs remain constant in local currency terms and if the value of USD doubled, Brazilian production costs will fall by half when measured in USD. In the graph here, the white line represents raw sugar front month prices, the green line represents USD real, and Brazilian real cross currency rate, and the purple line represents the amount of Brazilian sugar exports in 1000 metric tons. Between 1997 and 2003, the real lost 50-70% to of its value against major currencies. This coincides with especially strong growth of Brazilian sugar exports and a decline in global sugar prices during the same period. As the real began rebounding in 2003 and steadily strengthened except for a sudden appreciation during the peak of 2008-2009 financial crisis, the modest appreciation allowed Brazilian exports to continue increasing, but this also led to the corresponding hike in sugar prices from 2003 to 2009. Ethanol fermentation now uses 50 to 60% of total Brazilian sugarcane output. Policy support for ethanol as a major source of transportation fuel in Brazil has stimulated dramatic growth in the use of sugarcane for ethanol. The graph here shows the number of new sales vehicles that can be run on gasoline only, ethanol only, and on both gasoline and ethanol. Because ethanol is essentially a substitute for traditional gasoline, sugar and sugarcane prices display strong links to the oil and gasoline markets, particularly during periods of high oil prices. The Brazilian government mandates that all motor fuel must be blended with anhydrous ethanol. The minimum percentage blend required fluctuates between 10 to 25%. Here is world sugar prices at a glance. As you can see, although dotted with big fluctuations, sugar prices hiked in 2005 and remained on a strong upward trend from then. This has got to do with EU sugar reform. The EU, once a major exporter supplying 20% of global exports in the 1990s, shifted to become a net importer almost overnight following sugar reforms in 2005. The shift removed one traditionally important source of supply for the global markets, hence pushing world prices upwards. The EU has almost all kinds of protectionistic regulations possible. First, the 27 member countries have to adhere to production quotas. The excess cannot be sold in the market for food users. Next, the government pays minimum guaranteed prices to producers of raw and refined sugar. Lastly, in a situation of a shortage of sugar due to the production quota, trading houses are allowed to import from other countries, but only imports from African, Caribbean and Pacific states are tax exempt. As a result of all these reforms, sugar prices trended higher post-2005. Coming now to India, 
Growing consumption but volatile production has been the cause for large swings in the net trade for the country. India shifted from a net exporter to a net importer and back again. The magnitude of these shifts has increased as production cycles have become more exaggerated. Most recently, India switched from a net exporter of 5.8 million metric tons in marketing year 2007 and 8 to a net importer of nearly 2.5 million metric tons in marketing year 2009 and 10. So, what is the current situation like in Brazil? So, what is the current situation like now in global markets? In Brazil, flexi fuel car sales growth has dropped year on year in 2012 seeing that the recurring ethanol shortage and high prices are not sustainable for high percentage of blends, the Brazilian government adjusted down the proportion of minimum ethanol blend from 25% to 18% in April 2011. Gasoline prices have also veered off its peak, making ethanol a less attractive option than when gasoline prices were at all-time high. Ethanol, by the way, is a less efficient fuel than the traditional gasoline. This graph shows the amount of sugar cane produced and the amount of sugar and ethanol crushed and processed from sugar cane. The axis on the right refer to sugar cane output figures. Both sugar cane and ethanol output have been moving almost in tandem with each other. Ethanol production increases at a faster rate post-2007 because of an adjustment to higher percentage of ethanol blend. Subsequently, as the rate was adjusted down in 2011, ethanol production declined significantly. Going forward, the Brazilian government is unlikely to introduce drastic alterations to ethanol fuel policies in the near future, at least not until sugar and ethanol production is more stable. On a global scale, sugar production for the marketing year 2012 and 13 is forecasted to rise 2% from last year. More of Brazil's sugarcane harvest is expected to be diverted to sugar production than less profitable ethanol. Sugar yields are also expected to be higher than last year. In India, area planted for sugarcane is forecast to expand because it is expected to be more profitable than wheat and corn. US production is forecast to be up primarily due to higher sugar beet acreage. The combination of global surplus and reduced ethanol production is likely to pressure sugar prices in general. Very quickly, we will now see what are some trading strategies that we can adopt when trading sugar futures. We will explore three strategies, outright trading, trading on seasonality, and spread trading. Outright trading is very simple, buying low and selling high. Let us take a look at the prices. International sugar market has observed several major spikes in prices since the 1960s. A common theme is that after each peak, prices have quickly retreated to their pre-spike levels. If you think that the current price has not reached the pre-spike level and believe that it will continue to drop further in the future, then one way to express that opinion is to short the deferred contracts. One advantage of trading futures is that you can short a contract without owning it. Based on last 20 years' data of month-on-month -month change in prices, we see that the long position in June has more than 75% chance of positive returns, with an average of 6.3%. On the other hand, if you want to go short, April will be the best time. If you short in April, you have two-third chance of positive returns, and with an average return of about 2.9%. In addition to outright long and short positions, traders in futures markets commonly trade spreads. Spread trading is the simultaneous buying of a security and selling of a related security to speculate that the difference between the two securities will widen or narrow. For example, a July-October spread in sugar refers to the difference between the July and October sugar futures prices. Traders initiate spread positions when they think that the price difference between the two contracts will change to their benefit before the trade is offset. In fact, traders do not care about the absolute prices of the contracts, but only the price relationship. There are three different types of spreads, the calendar spread, the inter-commodity spread, and the inter-exchange spreads. Let's now take a real life... Let's now 
take a look at one real-life example of how to profit from spread trading in the sugars market. On 4th June this year, the price quota for October raw sugar contract was 19.27 cents per pound, and the price for next year's March contract is quoted at 20.36 cents per pound. This gives us an October March spread of negative 1.07 cents per pound. During that period, news of heavy rains impeding sugarcane harvesting and crushing hits the media every day. Ships were lined up at the Brazilian ports waiting to be loaded with sugar, but loading was slow. On the other hand, both the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Brazil's sugarcane industry association, UNICA, forecasted global supply surplus due to bumper crops in Brazil and India. As a trader, you will expect sugar futures prices to rise and the prices of nearby contracts to rise faster than deferred contracts in view of the short-term unanticipated tightness in supply. To express this view, you can long an October contract and short a March contract. Let's see what happens six weeks later. On 20th of July this year, the prices quoted for October raw sugar contract became 23.92 cents per pound, and the price for next year's March contract is quoted at 23.98 cents per pound. This gives us an October March spread of negative 0.06 cents per pound. Indeed, the October March spread narrowed, and you make a total profit of $1,153.60 for the spread trade. Spreads also experience some seasonality. According to seasonality data kept by MRCI, it seems to suggest that adopting a long March, short May strategy works well if you enter the market at around mid-March and exit the market at around mid-April a month later. The hit rate is as high as 84% and highest profit more than 2.5 times of biggest losses. Is it worth a try? Only if you trust the statistics. To conclude, Sugar market, like most other agricultural commodities market, is very much driven by its fundamentals. Long-term factors affect long-term trend of sugar prices, while short-term factors cause short-term volatility in prices. Because of sugar's importance in our daily lives, it is a heavily regulated and protected industry, especially in major producing and exporting countries. Policy changes in these countries can cause fundamental structural shifts in the world's sugar market. In order to profit from price movements in the sugar market, there are three main ways of doing so. Outright trading, trading on seasonality, and spread trading. <laughs>